well. Welcome to anyone who is watching on the live stream as well. Uh, just to remind that to all members. Like I forgot to switch my mic on. Never mind. Uh, just a reminder to all members or officers to uh, switch the microphones off when not in use. Uh, and, mo and, and mobile phones as well. Okay. Uh, Nicola, do we have any apologies for absence, please? Chair, we have apologies for absence from Councillor Deal. Thank you very much. If anyone has a look at item three of the minutes, they're to be noted for correctness. If anyone's got an issue with them, can you please raise your hand? That looks like a no to me. Uh, right, item four. Do we have any disclosure of members' interests? Councillor Oliver. Uh, Chair, I'd like to uh, disclose a personal but non-prejudicial interest in the planning application uh, 2103104. FUL because I know the applicants, uh, but I'm not prejudiced in any way. Thank you. Have you uh, spoke to the legal officer about this? I've spoken to a senior planning officer. Okay. Everyone's happy. Yeah. Well, I think it's ultimately my decision, but yes, I think okay. everybody's That's happy. Fine. Thank yeah. you very much, sir. Okay. At this point, I'm going to hand over to uh, Councillor Scott, who's going to do the plan session. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll just go through the procedure of the planning section of the meeting. So as chair, I will introduce the application. I will then ask the planning officer for any updates or changes to recommendations. We will then go to public speaking. The objector will get five minutes. Local councillor, a parish councillor, five minutes. Applicant or supporter will get five minutes. The five minutes will be split between the number of, of people that are here today. No questions are allowed to or by any public speakers. We will then go to members' questions to planning officers. Then we will go for rules of, for rules of debate. We'll need a, a proposal a seconder and then we can debate the the application. So I'll go to the first um, application. I think we're going to go to agenda item nine. Is that okay? So I've got 21031104 FUL Construction of a first floor rear garden room extension with balcony and external staircase. This is Saxby House Station Road, Corbridge, NA 45 5AY. And I will go now to the planning officer to do the presentation. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, as just explained, this is an application for construction of a first floor rear garden room with balcony and external staircase at Saxby House, Corbridge. I'll just run through the slides with you. Sorry, that that's very bright on there and you can't see very well. Um, but the, you can see that the site is located, um, if any of you know Corbridge, come over the bridge at Corbridge um, towards the station and this property is located um, overlooking the fields on the left hand side. I'll show you some pictures in a second. This is the property, um, a traditional double fronted um, stone property that's been previously extended. You can see here that these are the, the various extensions that they've already had to the property, which I'll, I'll go through at the end of the presentation. Um, this is obviously the, where I was discussing here, if you're going towards the station on the left hand side, and this is the property that you'll see um, adjacent to the field. So obviously the, the elevation that facing the field there is quite prominent. This is the existing elevations of the property. So as discussed, um, this is the original um, double fronted property. It's had a two storey side extension, um, a two storey rear extension and a further two storey rear extension and um, conservatory, which is currently on the property. These are the floor plans here. So um, you can see the original layout of the downstairs of the property with the two reception rooms. And the, on the right there, it's just showing the extent of the existing first floor, which obviously we'll probably come to discuss um, when we're talking about the merits of the case. So the proposal is to um, add a first floor 
conservative style extension, which you can see best on the right hand top corner. Um, so there would be a flat roof extension with a lantern light and obviously those, um, those large picture windows which would overlook the field plus a balcony area in front of the conservatory there that you can see. This is the floor plan here, it's just giving you a better idea. So um, this is the existing, you can't see my cursor very well, sorry. This is the existing conservatory on the back um, and obviously you'd be able to, they're proposing to construct the new sunroom area with a with the terraced area of it. Um, these are just some photos that we found from a previous application just to give you some idea about um, previous extensions to the property. So you can just see on this left hand picture here that there was a previous um, two storey flat roof extension which, which has had a pitched roof extension since then. Um, you can see the two storey extension to the left and the pitched roof rear two storey extension plus the conservatory. So that's just the photographs there for you. Um, I'll leave that one on the slide so you can have a look at it. Um, this application is for a property to be extended. It's in the green belt um, and in a small group of houses just outside Corbridge. I don't have any updates. Thank you, Chair. So now we will go to public speaking. I believe Mary Williams is here to speak on this planning application today. So Mary, you now have five minutes. OK, we would like to speak about three points. Firstly, the reason for our application. We'd like to address the notion of disproportionate development. And thirdly, unsympathetic design and scale. We have suffered from severe flooding twice in 10 years. There was a devastating flood in the Stanners in 2005, after which £1.2 million was spent on flood defences. Less than 10 years later, we were flooded even more devastatingly with Storm Desmond, a great harm caused to all property and land across our whole area. The entire contents of our house uh, downstairs had to be thrown into skips. The devastation is difficult to put into words. There's thick mud on every surface. The floors are twisted. You can't open the doors. When you eventually manage to smash the doors down, the doors are warped everywhere. Uh, all our soft furnishing, sofas, cushions, curtains dripping, and most upsettingly of all, you lose your photographs and all your memorabilia. So it's very, very traumatic. And the level of uh, trauma is directly related to the level of the flood. In 2005, the flood was over one metre high, but in 2015, in our house, it was 1.6 metres high. That is five foot six. I am only five feet tall. It is massively devastating. But the bad experience is extended by the amount of restitution and restoration required. There's endless, endless hours of meetings. You have to meet with contents insurers, buildings insurers, assessors, surveyors, builders, auditors, project managers, window specialists, meeting after meeting. At the same time, you're trying to find another home, look after your family, hold down a job, and try to hold the community together at the same time. The demands of rebuilding would be so much easier to deal with if we could live upstairs. And we could, because the first floor of the house is habitable. And this is what our application allows us to have, a first floor access and a room to live in in the day that isn't a bedroom. It would future-proof the house. It would enable us to return home as soon as critical services are back. And that's usually about two weeks. Addressing the second point of disproportionate development, I don't know why we are talking about areas and percentages, because this has already been allowed locally and special circumstances have already been established and agreed. In 2016, the planners allowed a neighbour eight doors down to our lane to increase the size of their already extended property well over 100% metres, 100%, lifting their house 2.6 metres off the ground so that they could access their house in the face of flooding and they could live in their house. And in their planning officer's report, it says, 
If measures like this aren't taken to safeguard local, com local properties, community remains disbanded and susceptible to future flooding impact. In another paragraph, they refer to the NPPF and they say, it's clear that in applying a flexible approach to dealing with applications of this nature in flood hit communities, that the social, environmental and economic aspects of the NPPF can be achieved. And the alternative is to leave a local community vulnerable to the impact of flooding and impose financial and social burdens upon the society. So on balance, very special circumstances exist that outweigh the harm by reason of inappropriateness and impact on the openness of the Greenbelt. We live in exactly the same area. In contrast, our officers say, we hope that following prevention works having been undertaken in the area, the property would not be affected in the same way. I am sorry, 1.2 million built on defences did not prevent an even more devastating flood 10 years later. And in October this year, there's a climate report that says, despite progress on flood risk management, flooding from rivers remains a major risk, especially on floodplains. The officer's report on Yotun the house I'm talking about also says it's considered to be contained within a built environment and not in open countryside. Sorry, that's your five minutes. So we will now go to members' questions to planning officers. Councillor Stewart. Yes, thank you, Chair. And for the officers there, we've heard there were special circumstances um, and the risks of two floodings. There. I don't know if there's any information about how any more preventive measures have been put in place after that money was spent. Um, so special circumstances, would this be permissible? A little bit more details about that, please. Um, so just to clarify, obviously, we are not flood experts. We can't predict whether or not there would be another flooding event. Um, what we have to look at is whether or not we think that in this particular circumstances, the harm that we've identified to the green belt and to the existing property would be outweighed by the very special circumstances put forward by the applicant. Now, obviously, what we've said in the report is that we do entirely sympathise with them, but in our view, the, it's not enough to tip the balance. Obviously, this property has been significantly previously extended. Um, members may decide that they um, think that the requirement for this um, conservatory at first floor is sufficient to outweigh all of that harm, but you would have to be happy that um, they wouldn't be able to live in the property without that if it was absolutely essential to have and therefore that it would outweigh all of the things that we've identified um, as causing harm. But on top of that, we also obviously have two separate reasons for refusal. The first one is whether or not you consider there to be very special circumstances that outweigh that harm. And then secondly, um, the reason for refusal on um, design and impact on character grounds. So. It may be that members want to look at those two things separately and we can have a discussion about that um, once you've decided whether or not you consider there are very special circumstances, but that is down to you. I think it would be handy to split that part. Thank you. Councillor Sessford. Thank you very much. Um, there's been a, a, a reference to another property. I didn't quite catch the name, Utah or something like that which is uh, not far away um, and the the planning result of their request in other words what I'm asking you is why is there a difference between the officers um, thoughts and considerations and outcome on one when you have a one not a million miles away and obviously also affected by the floods as the photos show quite clearly um, so, so, so what's the difference? Why is one acceptable uh, and one not? Okay, yeah, I think that's a really relevant question, Councillor Sessford, because it's really important that whatever we decide and as we assess these applications, we apply the same um, thought um, thoughts um, to um, how we determine the application. So. With Yachton, um, those, that application came in in 2016, so it wasn't long after the floods and um, it was before the, the most recent flood alleviation 
um, has been implemented um, there in the village. And so there is that difference in time. But um, second to that is um, the, uh, the, the, the difference in the application. So Yotton, as you know, was a property that was, um, it was sort of cranked up. And so all of the living accommodation, including key um, rooms within the home, including kitchen, living rooms, um, were all on the first floor. And the rooms on, on the ground floor were rooms that were capable to allow flooding to happen where the, the family could continue to be residents upstairs. The difference with this one is that the applicants are putting what looks to be another sunroom um, on the first floor, but not actually moving any principal um, accommodation up there. So they would still be left without um, a, a kitchen at the very least. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, will granting this application be able to give the residents of this property, Saxby House, the ability to continue to live on. It may be that post a flooding event that they could put in something temporary in any of their accommodation on the first floor, including what they've applied for. But what we're trying to say to you is the difference between this and the other property, Yotton, is that Yotton actually put all their principal living rooms up into their first floor as part of that application. And that, that's not what's being asked for here. Um, the, the second and key point to, to all of this is, so, so that could be considered very special circumstances, but the second reason for refusal on this is the design, um, well, it, the design amongst other things, um, the scale and massing of it as well. And you've got to have a look at it. And although you may decide that you make out very special circumstances so that you accept the arguments being put forward by the applicant, um, then you've also got to look at what they're proposing and whether you think that that is acceptable in scale and massing also. Um, so those are the things that we have looked at um, and we've said that it's not acceptable. But, but what I would like to stress here is um, we do have a great deal of sympathy for the applicants um, with the, the problems that and, and the concerns that they might have for another flooding event. and there may be possible a, a way to look um, at very special circumstances and get the right scheme designed, but this is not it. Thank you. Uh, I, I've, got, I've got another follow-up question. Before I ask that, um, just in the last few words you've just said there, you said it may be um, come up with another scheme or design. Has there been any interaction between both parties to try to to come up with an, I've got another question after this, by the way. Has there been any interaction between both parties to try to come up with a thing that is maybe very special circumstances? Or? Yeah, Kate's able to, to follow up on that. Um, so we have spoken to the agent for the application to explain what our concerns are and that fundamentally we think that a, another large extension to the property is not acceptable. But we do entirely appreciate that it would be very advantageous for the applicant to be able to access the property externally to the first floor. Um, so we said that if they would, if they're unsuccessful here or or at appeal, if that's how they choose to go, um, we'd be happy to discuss with them some way of getting that external access into the property. Okay, thank you very much. My last question, please, if you don't mind, is um, there's an awful lot of concern that this one in a hundred years or, a, or one in a hundred uh, flood that we had um, a few years ago could happen again, and I think the concern is that the new flood barriers or the, uh, the, the, the increased flood uh, barriers work that's been put in would not be sufficient to deal with that. Now, I know in your report, it, I haven't found it, but it said something like uh, you hope that would be sufficient. Of course, hope is not the word that they probably wish to uh, hear. More, you know, the words definite and, and things like that would probably be better. So what guarantee have we got? Well, as much as you can give a guarantee, of course, you know, uh, that the, the defences that exist now are going to be sufficient to deal with a situation that was faced six or so years ago. So what we're saying, Councillor Sessford, is that um, we absolutely can't guarantee that. That's beyond our control. What we can look at is, in the instance that there was a horrific flooding event, which obviously would be horrendous, um, 
is what they're proposing now absolutely necessary for them to continue to live in their property? And what we're sort of saying is that we there is a large property already, it has been significantly extended, and we're not sure that by the addition of this sunroom is essential for them to carry on living there and whether or not we could view that as very special circumstances. I've just pulled up the floor plans up there if members wish to have a look. Um, so if, obviously you can see the scope of the existing property and um, make a judgment for yourself. So obviously you can see there that they have um, the two large rooms there um, and additional bedrooms, bathrooms that could be utilised for habitable space should it be required. Thank you very much. <coughs> Councillor Riddle. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think much of what I was going to ask has just been answered, really. It was the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the speaker said that there was a property, I think she said, eight doors down. And, you know, I think you've answered that to the best that you can. Um, I think what, what concerns me is the fact that, um, and I think you've also answered this, that, it kept, that flooding or the risk of flooding could be considered as a, as a very special circumstance. That was yeah. just... To put that in black and white, that that can be agreed, because you know whether we like it or not, I think extreme weather events seem to be coming more more rapid, in in, in greater succession in, in in shorter times. So you know um, I've got a lot of sympathy for this, but I can also see the the problems of setting precedents and all the rest. Mm. But I do think that we need to be consistent in our decisions, and if we've allowed it eight doors down, then you know I think we've got to ask ourselves. Can we allow it here? Um, Chair, I'm not sure that was quite a question, but I, 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 I just want to, to come back on it. And, and yes, you're right. Um, we have used um, flooding and the vulnerability to flooding as a VSC, and we could continue to do that here. Um, what we're asking you to do is, it's, it's, whilst that could be a VSC, you need to ask yourself, does that allow the applicant to continue to live in that property when key principal rooms on the ground floor are flooded? It's not necessarily immediately future-proofing the, the property, and, and that's the concern here. Along with the second reason, which is the scale massing and design. And we also you know, have a duty and an obligation to have an eye on that as well. It may be that both of those things can be overcome, but um, we think that what the proposal is right here today doesn't go far enough. Councillor Oliver. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the question about whether flood mitigation uh, can be a, a, a very special circumstance, I think that, that's been clearly answered as a yes. Um, so that was the sort of main question I had. Um, this, I, I, can you just confirm that this is not in a conservation area, this, this property? I don't think it is because I live just down the road, but no, it's not. It's not. No, thank you. Um, and can I ask why this application has come to the committee uh, when the previous application that was refused uh, was, was was a delegated uh, decision? Um, this application was brought forward under our current scheme of delegation because the parish council is supporting the application, so it had to go onto our virtual list, um, and the director of planning and the chair and vice chair made a decision to bring it to committee. Okay, Th uh, thank you. And then a question around the the, ex uh, the sort of scale and massing and the and the extensions. I, I was a bit confused in the in the report. It said um, that there was a sort of cumulative. Um, uh, increase in the size of the property of about 125%. I think there were two different but similar figures used. Uh, but also uh, it mentioned uh, an increase of 44% in 1997. So what I'm, uh, but the 2000 application, 2010 application, which is the one that refers to the 121 and 124%, uh, was only a minor, I think it was just chasing, changing the roof line by the looks of things. So that wouldn't have added more than, you know, a, 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 a couple of percent. So that doesn't really sort of stack up because either it's 44% plus a couple of percent or 125% plus a, you know, 121% plus a couple of percent. So I, ju I don't know where the other sort of 60 odd uh, percent has, has come from. Uh, and is that a, a sort of a, a very old uh extension or because it, it uh, you know certainly the time i've lived around there i don't think we've seen anything on the scale of of that sort of extension so um just to clarify where the figures come from so um 
the way that we work out what percentage is, is an increase over the original dwelling, we take the date of July 1948, um, and anything after that contributes to um, an extension to an existing dwelling. So obviously, just to run through the um, photographs with you again, obviously the, um, the property's already been extended to, you can see on the bottom left-hand picture there, the two-storey extension to the left, the two-storey extension with a pitch roof to the back, um, the one that you just referred to was a flat roof two-storey extension on, right on the end corner that's had a pitched roof over it and then this conservatory. So you can see, obviously just um, you know, quite plainly from the pictures, that it's, it's significantly over the original dwelling. So the 44% I think might have come from one application and that was the cumulative impact of that particular application. But obviously we have to take all the previous extensions together. There is a discrepancy where, where we haven't agreed with the agent about the extent of the um, volume of those extensions. We think it's more like 125 and they think it's more around 80. But what we said in our report is notwithstanding the fact that we can't come to an agreement, it's obviously significantly over the, um, the limited extension. I mean, the previous guidance from um, Tyndale used to be 33%, members will remember. Um, we don't stick to that rigidly now, but that is a good guide for you to know what we would normally allow over and above that original dwelling. Thank you, but can I, I just, just to sort of clarify, I guess what, what I'm sort of trying to get at is when, the, when that, that sort of big leap was done, if it was, because I think in the, 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 the applications referred to in this report seem to be a 40 odd percent extension plus a, a small increase in volume with the change of the, the roof line on the, on, the, on the side of the building. Uh, so where does, is the rest of it much earlier? I mean, you showed a picture, uh, a black and white picture, uh, that, that, you know, I'm just wondering, was that something that was, could, have, could that have been way back in time and therefore should that, should that count? Um, so, yeah, the, the pictures that I showed there were from the 2010 application um, that was for putting the pitch roof on top of that um, rendered flat roof element you can see just on the right-hand side of that picture. Um, and those are the pictures that were taken by the officer at the time. But in terms of the history of the application, the two-storey extension to the side was in 1996. The two-storey rear extension with the pitch roof was 2001. The flat roof two-storey extension, we have no record of. Now, whether or not that was without planning permission, it may be, or it might be just there's been some loss of data there. Um, and then the conservatory was also in 2001. So they are all fairly recent, and the relevant date, as I've explained, is 1948. So they're all right. So this is the 2001 and the 2010. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So we'll now go to the next stage of the meeting, where we will need a proposer for this planning application. Councillor Hutchins. To stimulate debate, I'll propose the officer recommendation. Thank you. The officer recommendation to stimulate debate. Councillor Stewart. So we can now go to debate. Councillor Oliver. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. As I said when I sort of made my declaration at the beginning, obviously I live down the road and I know that area well. Um, and I too was, I have only been flooded once. I only lived there in 2015 and the flood was sort of chest, chest high in, in my house. So I know what it's like and I know that you basically your whole, the whole bottom floor of your house is, is trashed. So I can understand the applicants when they they want to try and do something to, to, to mitigate uh, th that. And, and I think you know, we as a, an authority ought to be doing whatever we can to, you know, within reasonable grounds to, to, to support anything that mitigates uh, flood protection. I've also been uh, Northumberland's representative on the Regional Flood and Coastal Committee. Uh, so I do know that the, uh, the, the, the works that have been done since, um, uh, since Storm Desmond uh, have strengthened the flood defences 
uh, but they haven't increased the level of flood, flood protection. So the, the actual level of the top of the flood bund is exactly the same as it, as it was uh, prior to Storm Desmond. So if there was another Storm Desmond type event, uh, uh, yeah, there were two issues with Storm Desmond. The flood defences breached, but they also overtopped. So they breached first, and then the, the volume of water was so massive that uh, it, it actually overtopped the flood defences, uh, and that would happen again. So regardless of you know the strengthening uh, and all of the money that's been spent on it, if we had another Storm Desmond event, all of the houses in that area would would flood. And on that night, when I was upstairs in the, you know, in uh, in, in my house, I looked across the road to a, you know, an, another house across the road, and I literally couldn't see the front door; it was completely underwater. So that gives you a, an, an indication of the, the sort of scale of the event. Um, the 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 officers uh, and others have mentioned uh, the applications, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a other applications in the area to mitigate, and I think there have been two. Uh, Yotun has been mentioned, and that's a, a very large house, uh, which you know you, you see across the field as you approach uh, from from the roundabout, uh, and that was raised. The whole the whole of the ground floor was effectively raised up uh, by by I think 2.6 meters. So you know quite a large volumetric increase in in the size of the scale of the house across the open sort of across the open field. And there was another house. Um, uh, was granted permission as well, which is standards close, uh, which is, you know, that, that, that was granted a, a permission to build okay, a... thank you, Councillor. Sorry? Oliver. No, 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 sorry, see? I was just saying I'm waiting oh, on I thought skill. you were... <laughs> Carry on. Sorry. <laughs> uh, standards close was granted permission to, to build a three-storey extension, um, uh, and it hasn't actually been built, but it, ha it, it was granted permission, I think, in uh, uh, 2016. Um, and, and so, yeah, I guess I, the, the sort of point I'd make is about consistency um, and doing what we can. We've established that, that, that um, uh, flood mitigation is a, you know, can be a, a very special circumstance. Storm Desmond was a very special flood, uh, and there was one, another one 10 years before that. And uh, so we have had two events in, in uh in, in the you know in the past 15 16 years we're also likely to get more because you know the the evidence is uh, that, that, that the, these events will become increasingly frequent and I think also the um, flood zone three is the highest level uh, of, of flood risk uh, but I think the actual uh, probability of flooding in, in in that area of Corbridge has increased from one in a hundred uh, to one in 75 but it's important that all committee members uh, uh, understand that that doesn't mean that it's going to be another 75 years uh, before it floods again. You know, it's, it's a bit like shaking a dice. You don't get a six every six shakes. Uh, it, it, this could happen tomorrow. It could happen in 150 years. None of us know. Uh, and so it is a very uh, serious risk. And I, I think it's, it's important to, that, that, that people are allowed to, to sort of mitigate those risks. I think also in terms of the uh, the, 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 the point around um, actually living in the house, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I was the, probably the first back into our house after Storm Desmond, and I think the Williams were amongst the last back in. Uh, but it's it's a very, um, it, 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 you, you want to get back in as quickly as you can. And when one house floods, all of the other houses in the area flood. So that means all of the tradesmen, all of the insurance uh, people, uh, everybody that, you know, and in our case with Storm Desmond, it, and it would likely to be the same again, it was, it, you know, it was all of those houses in Corbridge, but it was also hundreds of houses in Carlisle. So all of the loss adjusters, all of the insurance people, all of the tradesmen in the whole of the region were busy. All of the houses available to rent were taken up within within days. And it's very, very difficult to... Uh, uh, to, to, to find a way to live through that sort of event. So if there's an opportunity to stay in your house, as has been granted to Stanners Close and to, to Yotton, then I think that, that makes a, a, a real difference to, to you know, peace of mind. Uh, another point worth making is that we, you know, uh, we, we, we do have insurance and there's a government scheme uh, called Flood Re, which underpins insurance in, the, in this uh, for extreme flood events. But that has a limited life. So in 18 years' time, uh, the government has stated that you know, that will no longer exist. 
Uh, I've got no idea what the Williams were paying in insurance before Storm Desmond and before Fl Flood Re was introduced, but I was paying £10,000 a year uh, for, my, for my flood insurance. So it, it's quite likely that, that you know, once uh, Flood Re uh, 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 is, is sort of, is, you know, disappears, as is the government's stated intention, then, you know, all of the people living in, and, and there are hundreds of thousands across the country, uh, living in, in those areas will, will suffer uh, not only the, the, the constant worry of another flood, but they will also suffer the additional costs of, of having to leave, uh, live with it. And you can't actually pr uh, prevent water getting in to an old house like that. We looked at it ourselves in a stone house, uh, and, and you know, there's nothing you can do with modern you know, houses, with you know, tanking and things, but basically, you know, the, the, you, you, there's no, there's no real mitigation. You have to, well, the, sorry, there's no real protection. There is mitigation. Uh, so I think, you know, if if it's at all possible to to find a way to support, uh, then I think we should be we should be looking to do it. Thank you. Councillor Horncastle, did you want? unusual area and it's not just a straightforward decision based on policy because there is something uh, that we as a committee must look at and that is special circumstances special circumstances so we must consider these as well so what about the flooding right many years ago when I uh, represented a different area uh, Hayden Bridge there was a massive flood along the Tyne, and I visited the properties in Hayden Bridge that were flooded, and it was absolutely desperate to see what had happened. It was just sheer uh, desperation, despair, devastation. People out of those houses, some of them were out of them houses for a year. Uh, and then what happens? You get houses that's unsaleable, you can hardly get them insured. So you're kind of stuck, you're kind of stuck where you are. And then at the last flood, uh, what was it, 2015, 2016, I visited these, this area in Corbridge. And it was indeed five foot six high because uh, I was there on a special council visit to the area. And uh, we were in some of the properties and it was absolutely unbelievable what had happened to these properties. So, we've got this flooding problem. Now then, it says in the agenda that... Uh, Following significant prevention works have been undertaken by an environment agency, and it, say, it uses the word hope. Those prevention, preventative measures that the environment agency have put in will not protect these properties. There's no way, and until the envir environment agency change their way of thinking and actually does what needs to be done, instead of raising the bit earth mound along the river every time the river bottom rises, these, flood, these properties will flood, right? That is, without question, these properties are going to flood again. So then we've got to ask ourselves that, uh, you know, it's left to the property owners themselves to do something because they're not being looked after by government agencies who in my opinion, don't really give a damn about uh, these people at all because they're not doing what's needed. Anyway, so what can these people do? They've got a house they cannot sell. They've got a house they can hardly insure. Uh, they've got a house where, looking at the size of it and the shape of it, probably would need a lottery win to jack this one up, unlike the other one a little bit further down. So what do they do? They've got to find a way of protecting themselves when the next flood comes. And like Council Oliver says, that flood could come any time. So, as a committee, I, I, can understand, I can understand the officer's recommendation. I really do. If I was in your position, I, I would probably come up with the same recommendation. It's not a, probably not up to you to work out if these are special circumstances. It's for the committee, for us to sort of, like, discuss it. I think there is special circumstances in this. So, 
Uh, I won't be supporting Councillor Hutchinson's uh, proposal. We'll see what comes out of it. But I just hope the committee can actually do what they're here to do, and that is actually consider the special circumstances that they've been given. Councillor Sesford. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Councillor Horton Castle has stolen a few of my uh, words there. And that's probably because they're quite an obvious thing to think of. I mean, his first line was going to be my first line, and that is if this was a, um, a normal out of the flood area, floodplain area, we'd be looking at designing mass, and it might come up with a different answer because it probably is bigger than is normally allowed. But to me, it's a, it's a choice between uh, the design and man, massing on one hand and whether or not there's special circumstances on the other hand. And if I find that there are special circumstances, then maybe that overrides the design and massing because if there are special circumstances, then they have to do something higher than the first floor to come up with a solution. And I listened to what Councillor Oliver said about the, the wall being breached and overtopped. And a collection of both obviously is disastrous and even if it's just over top and that's quite disastrous as well but worse obviously if the whole dam has been uh, the whole wall has been breached and uh, so i'm thinking of these special circumstances now again i, I understand fully what uh, the officers are saying because uh, because it's something that came into my head early on that you know they haven't moved everything upstairs there is no uh, kitchen upstairs and things like that but on the other hand, and sorry, I'll go back to what there is no kitchen upstairs, and if downstairs decimated, you've still got the dodgy doors that won't open, and the stink and the smell and all that, and uh, that is something, of course, which I would not like to face, as other people have done. Um, but the thing is, if this is, does, doesn't happen for another 20 years, do you want to have a kitchen upstairs, or do you want to have circumstances where like there's sort of a an emergency plan where if you do get uh, flooding in right we're living upstairs so we've got something in plan to cope with it some extra kitchen facilities because it's not flooded for the year that you're out it's flooded for the the first two or three weeks or however long you said before two weeks i think you quoted uh, until the waters uh, um, and go down again and then all the hard work starts and is it better that the hard work stops if they're on site or if they're one of my residents in Hexham? Well, more than one of my residents, but one I spoke in depth to at Tyne Green, because if you remember Tyne Green is flooded as well. They were at the house for 15 months. They lost four cars. And uh, the only place they could get for the size of the family uh, was down in Jesmond. And that made life a lot difficult coming up all the time. So this is one of the schemes where I can actually own more or less uh, agree with uh, both parties. I have, I have no problem at all with uh, what we've been presented here with uh, by the, the planning officers. No problem at all. However, uh, I, I will agree with uh, Councillor Horncastle in this case that um, because there's no guarantee that this is going to be flood free, then I think uh, we need to assume that sometime it may flood. And that, what do they do? And that is create extra space upstairs, whether there's a kitchen there or not, which is the first thing that did come into my mind, by the way. And so I'll have to say that I do actually think that special circumstances probably have been proved in this case. Councillor Hutchinson. Just, <clears throat> excuse me, just for the record, Councillor Owen Castle, I proposed the officer recommendation to stimulate debate it's actually really done that i didn't say which way i was going to vote i said to stimulate debate because everybody was sitting on their hands and nobody was putting a hand up thank you has anybody got anything else to say councillor riddle yeah i think uh, undoubtedly there are very special circumstances here i think the the other side of it is um is the design right and you know that's the conundrum at the moment. Um, do we pass it and allow this to, um, which is quite a large extension, you know, it's quite quite big, um, or do we refuse it and it comes back with a different design 
with the acceptance really from the committee that there are very special circumstances of raising it. So that's what I've got to balance in, in my mind before I vote. Councillor Oliver. I, I realise we've moved beyond questions, Chair, but I just wonder whether I could ask the planning officers about that point that Councillor Riddle's just made. Would it, uh, and I'm getting probably two or three steps ahead of, uh, of where this may not go in any case, but if, 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 the, if the committee were minded to, could the committee make a recommendation, um, assuming that the proposals that have already been made, uh, which is to accept the officer recommendation, get rejected, uh, to, to actually uh, agree a permission, but for delegating um, permission, uh, de delegating uh, responsibility to the officers to deal with the applicants to find, because um, there's sort of, there's, there's sort of two elements, I think, to the actual design of this. There's the the kind of the open countryside aspect of it and the, and, the, and, the, and the view as you drive out from Corbridge towards this sort of group of houses. And then there's also the, 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 the sort of scale and, uh, and, and massing. But I wonder whether there could be some design tweaks, uh, such as tying in the gable end at the north end of the, the, the you know, with the village end of the, uh, uh, the property, so that effectively, because as you drive out, it's quite striking. You've got a sort of um, a cream uh, gable end with the sort of uh, stonework featured in it, and whether you could actually tie, tie something in. Uh, that, that sort of basically ties that extension into the to the main house and makes it look as part of, rather than having a sort of glass uh, front facing that way and then there'll be glass on the other two sides so the question is that you know if if, if if the committee were minded to would would that be something that could be technically or legally done yeah i was just going to give you some of the options that are available to you members because i do think you have had a good debate about whether very special circumstances exist in this application so one of the options that you could do is defer this application for a set period of time to give the applicant an opportunity to take on board what you've said and perhaps revisit the design you see, tied in with the very special circumstances, how you assess the harm of the proposal on the green belt, and that's why you're running very special circumstances. So, in order to really demonstrate that you've considered that properly, um, I think it needs to come back to committee so that you understand the the impact of the design on the green belt and whether you continue to agree that there are very special circumstances for the design. So, I think. What you're saying here is that the design isn't quite right because it is going to have some harm in the green belt. However, you're very close to being able to accept that there are the very special circumstances and the and the that that you know relatively um, realistic prospect of flooding in the near future again. So that would be the first port of the the, the first recommendation I would have to you is to defer it rather than do some sort of a semi-approval um, subject to revised designs coming in to us, because I think you really, you members need to see that design yourselves before you come to that decision, um, so that you can demonstrate that you have properly assessed it under all the green belt tests. Um, the, other, the other option is to refuse it and let the applicant have their free go. Um, and I'm not sure that's really uh, an appetite. It's something that you would have an appetite for. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Kate is suggesting that the applicant might be interested in just running an appeal on the proposals that they have, which is why they might want a decision. Um, but it may be that they would rather just have one more go with the design and, and revisit it and bring it back. Well, in some scenarios, um, applicants want a decision. So if the decision continues to be a refusal, then they've got the opportunity to appeal it. Um, yeah. But I, I'm not sure that's... I don't think that's what the committee wants. Yeah. It, it, it's in our hands, not yeah. the hands of an inspector. So, <clears throat> I think those are your realistic options. Councillor Oliver. Can I just, just ask a question about that last point you made about the, whether the applicant might want uh, an, an appeal. Uh, presumably, if the applicant went to appeal and then lost the appeal, 
the chances of them getting any sort of permission uh, to do anything would be massively reduced. Is, is that is that a reasonable um, it, assumption? It could it potentially. It depends, and and I think actually where you are this evening is that you are quite convinced that via very special circumstances exist, an inspector may take a different view, and if the inspector took that view, then it would be a much more difficult scenario for for you to take a different view to a planning inspector. Yeah. Thank you. That's one thing about clarification of what you're proposing. So say we do go to the stage where you're saying that you accept the very social circumstances, just in order so that actually if it is deferred and we are going to have some correspondence with the applicant, I just want to be clear about what it is that you're asking us to go back and do. Now, what officers are saying to you is that we don't think some minor tweaks are acceptable um, to make the design um, acceptable in terms of what we're looking for. Really, what we'd be asking for is for that to be re ideally moved away from that particular location so it's not in such a prominent place. So what I'm asking you is, if you consider there are BSE, are you considering that you're happy with the extension in the location that it's in and of the scale that it's in? In which case that gives us a really good guide to speak to the applicant and actually then just make quite minor changes or actually is what you're saying is that you want to look at want us to look at giving them some accommodation at first floor but elsewhere on the property because otherwise it's going to be very difficult for us to have those discussions with the applicant. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Hutchinson. On this deferral thing, have you any idea? You, you've been working with the applicants. Have you any idea uh, if they would think a deferral would be appreciated or would they want a a yes or no straight away? I know it's a difficult question, but... They have asked us previously if there's anything they could they could do to make it acceptable and they, that they would look to revise the design if we thought that it was... The officer recommendation was obviously that we didn't think it was appropriate um, or that we might consider some kind of external access. But if that's what members would like, I'm sure that the applicants would like to work with us to do so. Right, thank Counts you. Councillor Sessford. It's quite difficult for us, I think, to give an opinion on what they should and shouldn't do between the pair, pair of years as to what other scheme they come back with. I mean, you know, uh, really what what we need to, is for, sorry, want, coming on for what you've said, Liz, is for, them to go, for you both to go away and try to thrash out something that's acceptable to both. And you come up with the best you can and bring that back to here. And if it's not acceptable, it's not acceptable. But I, th I think for us to say, well, we want the house on the left, the house, the extension on the, the left side, the bottom side, we want it covered with stone, it's not really, I don't think it's for us to say that. I think it's for both sides, yourselves, uh, to come up and say, well, this is what we're coming back with. Given that, given on the... I do appreciate I'm putting the, you in... Uh, yeah. And we're accepting the flood. I do appreciate I'm putting you in a difficult yes. position. I don't expect you to come up with a scheme that might be acceptable. Um, what I'm just saying is it, if members are happy that something in that location that you could accept something if there were just some minor tweaks, then we can go away and absolutely work with that. But it's, if we're looking at an entirely different scheme, then that's a different conversation. Um, Chair, if I could just add, you know, I, th I think, you know, where, where we need to get to this evening is a decision on whether you're going to um, accept the recommendation, refuse the recommendation or defer to allow the applicant to come in with some further design. They're here tonight. They've heard a lot about the conversation. We know the strength of feeling about the flooding and the very special circumstances that exist. And we can pick up a conversation with the applicants and their agent and see if we can have a coming together in respect of the design and return the application to you. Councillor Horncastle. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, if it was deferred and that the committee's looking on the application positively, but some members of the committee have a problem with the design, if it was deferred and you could come to uh, an agreement with the applicant and the agent, I'm thinking about timing here, the fact that you know we are running the plan uh, systems under so much pressure. It could be June before this gets back to a committee. Is there any way, if, if the committee is happy, that you could and, and you come to agreement that it would be delegated behind the scenes? 
I'm just okay. thinking that you, because there is a, a serious backlog of plan applications and something like this, if you're thinking about flooding, they want to get a start in the spring as quick as possible. I'm just asking the question about timing and how, how, technically how could we do it? I would hope it would be able to come back if we can organise things sufficiently quickly that we could get it on the agenda for February. We've already passed the agenda for, for January, but it would be at least February and provided that we could have those discussions and get amended plans in fairly quickly, we would get it on the first available agenda. You know, I don't think we're talking about months and months, but I, I do agree with Liz, I don't think it's appropriate for us to delegate such a big change to the scheme, perhaps, without it coming back. Councillor Hutchinson. Could I withdraw my proposal? And <laughs> And make another proposal of uh, deferment for uh, what? I'll that one. If we have a seconder, if the seconder withdraws as well, then that's fine. So we're back to the beginning of yep. the debate. Well, we've, I think we've had the debate, really. <laughs> but at least it stimulated the debate, my first proposal. Councillor Horncastle. Sorry, has somebody made a proposal? We got a new proposal. Councillor Hutchinson. Which is? Oh, sorry, Defer I missed that. Defer Believe it or not, deferment. Okay. Can we have some reasons? Um, because making a decision on the actual proposal that we have, on the proposal, the plans at the moment, uh, appear to be, well, among us all, very difficult to make that decision. So to allow more time to put a, uh, an acceptable application forward, I, for, I therefore propose okay. deferment. So, um, so um, uh, yes, uh, invite revised plans to yeah. deal with design concerns. With, with design, etc. Mm. Yeah. as part of it. Yeah. Thanks. Councillor Stewart, did you second that? Yes, that's right. Um, so we'll have to go back to a debate. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Councillor Sesford. Uh, well, I mean, we don't have to go back to a debate because nobody might want to say anything. But I just want to make it clear, and I think Councillor Horncastle is okay with this, hopefully, is that with, within this proposal, it should have been noted that um, part of it's already sort of you know, like being accepted, as in we're proposing that we accept there are special circumstances, because not everybody's actually spoken on that tonight, and I think it's important that all officers, uh, sorry, all members, actually agree with the fact in the first place that mm. they're agreeing with the special circumstances. Otherwise, we're defeating the objectivity. <laughs> okay, so herein lies the difficulty with that, because if we're going to defer it and bring it back, we're bringing it back for you to appraise everything again, there may be some of you members here. There may be other members that are absent that join it for the okay. first time. So we will be revisiting the whole scheme and the very special circumstances again. That said, you've talked about the flooding in a lot of detail tonight and how you feel that that could. And we've given you the advice about how that could be um, uh, sufficient to be a very special circumstance. But you need to look at the design and appraise it against all the Greenbelt policy to come to the same conclusion potentially again. So no, it's it's all open for debate when we bring it back again. Thank you. So now we'll Councillor go. Oliver. Councillor Oliver. Councillor Oliver. Thank you. I, I, sorry, I don't want to prolong this, but I just there was one point that I forgot to mention is that, that this application has an external staircase, which I think is a key feature uh, that doesn't exist in, in I think, uh, Yotton and, and Stanners Close. And I think what that allows is basically if, if a flood event happens, you can board over the top of the existing in, internal staircase, effectively create a completely separate uh, living space. Uh, and obviously, notwithstanding the fact that it currently doesn't have a kitchen, but that would be presumably with an electric cooker would be quite easily solved. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, you do get enough warning from the environment agencies to move your fridge upstairs as well. So it, 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 I think that, you know, that, that, that's a really key feature of, of what we've got proposed here. We, you know, it, it's a sort of additional living space, bedrooms. Yes, kitchen has to be resolved, but an external staircase makes it all work and brings it all together. 
Councillor Hutchinson. One thing we did make comment on was the length of time of deferment. If it is voted for deferment, um, are we seeing the end of February? So it would very much, yeah, it would very much depend on when the applicant, we want to give them some space to be able to revise the plans, but we will agree an extension of time with them that would be reasonable for revisions, for discussions, revisions to plans, reconsultation, and then um, through, the, through the process again to take it to committee. Mm -hmm. Right, that's great, thanks. So I'll ask Tessa to confirm exactly what we're voting for today. So now we have the proposal is to defer the application to allow for more time for acceptable revised plans to deal with design concerns to be submitted and for it to return to committee as soon as possible. So can I ask you to show your hands who is in favour of this proposal? That's eight four. Against? Against? Sorry. I won't vote on this because I was slightly late coming into the meeting. So that's abstain, one abstain. So do you want to go against? Those against? Or So the proposal is carried. Inappropriate actions of the Environment Agency. And this is going to become a, a, a real common problem along the certain parts of the, the Tyne from Hayden Bridge, uh, Corbridge and even further east. Is there any way that this local authority uh, under planning rules, regulations, what things behind the scenes we don't know about, we can actually rezone these areas? I know they're zoned anyway, some of it is floodplain and that, but from, from a, a planning point of view, because this is now going to become more common uh, that people want to protect the houses that they are going to be unable to sell. So this is not, this is probably the first of quite a few applications that will be coming in. Other applications could be totally different to this, obviously. But is there any way we can talk to Rob about some something we can look at about these fl these these flood areas that are going to have some special planning uh, applications coming in? Um. Cheryl, I'll just answer that. Um, but um, I think your point's a good one. Um, probably, possibly not zoning, um, but maybe int introducing um, uh, supplementary planning guidance for um, re for, for you know homes that get caught up in flooding events or the potential to get caught in, so that they can make sympathetic you know, well-designed alterations to their property to adapt for those types of circumstances. Maybe there's a way that we could we could deal with that, and I'll pick that up with Rob and Joan in the policy team. i just come back there. I mean, I think that's a great idea, because uh, if I had a situation like that, uh, with please this plan guidance, you may find that in time to come, years to come, uh, if this is sort of a common practice, you might have people who come forward with more appropriate designs in the first instance, you know, designs that actually cover the flooding uh, situation. That's right. And maybe, you know, to avoid a scenario like this where we've talked about, do does it need to have principal accommodation on the first floor or is it acceptable that they do something, you know, after the event, you know, maybe some guidance on that so we could, you know, bring in a piece of policy. Um, to give some guidance so that the applicant gets it spot on first time. We're going to take a three minute break for Mr and Mrs Williams to leave. Can you cut the live feed in please?
Thank you. So now we have three applications for land of north east of Bishop's Garage building. I'm going to read the, the reference numbers out for each one and then Kate will do a presentation on the, the applications. So we have 210299ADE. 21025000 ADE, 21025001 ADE. This is land of north of Bishop Garage Building, Alemouth Road, Hexham, NE46 3PG. We don't have any public speakers. For, the, for these applications. I'll go over to Kate for the presentation. Thank you. Um, so just for ease today, members, we're going to do a presentation covering all three of the different advert applications rather than going through them each one by one. But at the end, um, we'll have debate on all three and then take three separate decisions. I hope that's OK. Um, so just by way of an update, following the submission of amended plans for application 21 slash 02500 ADE, um, condition two of that recommendation needs to be updated as they reduced the totem sign by a further half a metre. So the recommendation should now, the approved plans condition should now state the development hereby permitted shall not be carried out otherwise in complete accordance with the approved plans. The approved plans for this development are, I won't read it all out, um, but it's got the correct reference in um, relating to the revision and I'll make sure that um, that's forwarded on for the minutes. So the, you'll all know this site as um, the bunker site in Hexham. Um, you'll know that the application for the McDonald's um, came forward to committee some months ago and was approved. So this is the site um, here. You'll, I'm sure you'll all know it quite well. Coming off the roundabout, the little store um, is currently underway. And the entrance to the site um, and to the rear of the site, the travel lodge, um, is behind and the McDonald's building will sit in between but has yet to be commenced. So this is just a location plan to show you um, the blue line is the conservation area so it shows you that uh, the majority of the conservation area lies within the main area of the town but it does extend up to the abutments with the um, bunker site and this area of the conservation area opposite the site is mainly to do with the um, station, the railway station and those buildings there, that's why that's included. So you'll also see that just referenced there, there are a number of uh, letters and the most important ones and things that we'll be talking about today um, relate to the prominent buildings of the Abbey, the old jail and moot hall and those buildings which are listed as A, B, C um, up there that you can just see on the plan. Sorry, it's very small. So an aerial plan there, obviously taken prior to the commencing, you can see the um, the site just on the south side of the railway line there and you can see that's that green belt there. So this is some photographs that the case officer took fairly recently before committee and you can see that the little store there, this is standing on the bridge um, with the railway just to the right there underneath the bridge and you can see the little store is well underway and the travel lodge also um, behind that. So the, this site is in between those two buildings. That's just giving you a better view there. So also just a note here, this is the access which has been formed down into the site and you see it's on quite a slope from the, um, the new access at the roundabout coming all the way down. So the McDonald's building's actually sat sort of at the bottom of that ramp. So just in terms of the applications, I'll run through what they're actually for. So this application, 2499, is for installation of four fascia signs, three booth lettering signs and one digital booth screen. So I'll just run through what they are. And these plans are really small, actually. Is it okay? If, do you mind if I stand up and I'll just point to it? It's probably a bit easier. Let me know if you can't hear me. Sorry. So, um, this application is for the signs, um, which are mostly around the rear of the building here. So, the signs that we're looking at is this name sign, the gold march on the front and the rear, and also these are the booth signs, which are by these windows here. And this is an illustration of what the lettering looks like. So um, we're talking about this lettering here and here, but you'll note um, this is just an illustration, but this one shows the uh, lettering high above the eaves of the building. But actually in this case, 
they've been requested to be set down so that they're not seen above the backdrop of that building. Um, yeah. So this is just another sign, again, showing you that sitting above the building, but these ones have been ensured to make sure that they don't sit above the, the roof of the building. There. This is the booth sign, which I've just located, if any of you have ever been to McDonald's, um, as you go through where you need to pay and what have you at the window, that's what these are. So the next one is the totem sign, which is under application 2500, which I'm sure is the one that probably you'll want to discuss. This is the location of the totem sign here. So if you'll recall when I showed you the, the picture, um, this is the access ramp coming down, and it's right at the bottom of that ramp there. Um, as we've discussed earlier, this has been reduced significantly in height and has come down another half a metre since the original report was written. So that's where that's going to be. This is the totem sign here, so the background these parts are illuminated, um, this one and this one, and they're background lit. Um, the next application, um, which is for 2501, is for all the signs that go, um, again, if you're familiar with it, when you're driving into the drive through there are menu signs. Um, so we have some of these menu signs here. And also this particular application also covers all the smaller signs around the site. Um, so this is the menu board um, that we're talking about. This one is a double one as you go into the site and it splits into two lanes. This one's at the front. And then these are the dock signs which are referred to in the application. So they are mounted on poles and um, they're small signs just showing you, you know, give way, no entrance, all of the things that you would normally expect to see. So the officer report sets out the main issues that have been considered in the assessment of the application, including matters of amenity and public safety as required by advert regs. No concerns have been identified in relation to public safety, and the main issues that have been considered are the effects on amenity, particularly in the context of effects on the setting of designated heritage assets and the historic town of Hexham. As set out in the reports, the applicant has amended the proposals on all three applications in order to assess, address comments and initial concerns raised by design and conservation. These changes have reduced the extent and size of signage across the site and the, built, the design and built heritage officer is now satisfied with these amendments and raises no objection to any of the scheme. On the basis of the changes to the proposals, as well as conditions that look to mitigate and reduce the potential impacts of illumination, the proposals are not considered to result in harm to the setting of heritage assets and are felt to be acceptable in terms of amenity, including in the context of the McDonald's site, as well as the wider redevelopment of the bunker site and other commercial development in the immediate area. It's recommended that permission is granted for each application, subject to the conditions set out within the officer reports with the audition, updated condition two, as set out at the beginning of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. So now we will go to members' questions to planning officers. Nick Morphe. Thank you. I just wanted to check one thing. Um, in, in the description of, of the first application, which is um, 02499, which is on page 20, um, paragraph 2.3, it says that um, the booth lettering signs, uh, one of them will be 0.7 metres in height and two of them will be 1.6 metres in height, which is obviously a lot bigger. Uh, I just wanted to check that's true, that's accurate. 2.3 in the first application. Page 20. Page 20. And the other, what they are are the booths the booth signs so they're the ones on this diagram here which are shown on elevation a in the top left so the signs are actually um they're actually so small that you can hardly see them on the drawing there but they are by the windows of those booths just for like payment and things so yes they are at different heights depending on what it's for so um you can see there in the far right window there's a very small black square and um, that is the one that's the lower height um which is obviously just showing you the digital screen for what you've got to pay but yes, they are, they are slightly different heights, but what's in the report is correct, if that's answering your question. Councillor Morphy. Okay, so I thought that the letters themselves were 1.6 metres in height, but are you saying that they, they are small letters at a height of 1.6 metres? 
So the, the signs are at the booth window, so it's actually the location of the sign is, that's the height, rather than the actual letters on the sign. Thank you. Yes. Sorry if I misunderstood your question, question the first time. Councillor Kennedy. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just minded to, to see the consultee responses, uh, page 22. And on what's another one. Page 22. Uh, and the one page 32. So the town council, um, which has recently had a Texan neighbourhood plan uh, approved and obviously should be applied to all of this. And I don't know what it is mentioned as part of the development plan policy. So they're highlighting that um, this is not in line with the principles of the de design outlined in the neighbourhood plan HNP2 and not complying with Hexham shop front design guide, um, that it's not protecting the Hexham conservation area, the heritage assets, HNP3 and HNP4. I was just wondering what has the officers, what do the officers view of that is? Or is the town council right or wrong? Um, well, I would never, n never go so far as to say that they were right or wrong about about what comments that they wish to make. Um, obviously, they are citing policies in their neighbourhood plan, which are covered in the officer's report. So we have taken those into account when assessing the application. So what we're very mindful of is that we are only allowed to assess um, amenity and public safety as part of an advertisement application. Um, and as part of that, what the officer has done is gone through each application and assessed it in terms of amenity, not only in the immediate area, but also looking towards the conservation area. Um, obviously, we, are, we have taken advice from our own um, design and built heritage officers who are now happy with the revised scheme that's come forward. So just to give you some context, that we have gone back to the applicants and they have revised each application to reduce anything that might be considered a, a proliferation of adverts or reduce the size of them where appropriate. So, for example, there were a number of other signage on the um, Elevation A, which is up there on the left, which they've removed because we considered them to be unnecessary. Um, so they have gone quite away. And obviously you'll be able to see in the officer's report that we have taken all that into account, but on balance we think that they're acceptable in the context of um, the application site, the wider bunker site, and also on the townscape itself. Councillor Horncastle. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> yes, McDonald's, very emotive. Get the blame for everything in the world. But many years ago, when we had, some of us had planning meetings in a different place, Prospect House of Hexham. I remember having discussions about certain signs and we were then told by officers at the council, it's, it doesn't matter what the sign says, it's what it actually looks like. So if this sign actually said RSPCA or the Salvation Army, I don't think there'd be half the complaints saying. But am I right in saying it doesn't matter what the sign says, it's what it looks like. Thank you. Does anybody have any other questions? Councillor Kennedy. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank, thanks for that. Um, I am conscious um, that, could we have a look? At the sign that's going to be the most prominent because obviously the, the, a lot of these signs are going to be tucked in the um in in the below below the roads side because because that that site is is in a dip so i think there's um the signage that sort of sits in that dip area is going to be well screened i'm just conscious of the, of the one that is at the highest point, let's say, on the road, next to the roadside. Could, could we see, see those pictures again? So the, 
Um, just to clarify, none of these adverts are going to be on the roadside. They're all within the site. Right. So you will have to come down the ramp into the site and the, the most, what I assume would be the most contentious sign will be the totem sign, which is the um, the highest sign, but actually won't be any higher than the, than the building itself, which will be located in the corner of this car park. You can just see that there. Um, if anyone's unclear, I can point it out for you again. But none of these signs are actually adjacent to the main road. They're all within the site. Right. Councillor Kennedy, there will be an, um, an application in for whatever is going to go on the road, but we haven't got that yet, oh, and it's okay. not before you today. Right. So the applications, the series of applications that we're looking at, are all within the site um, <coughs> of the slide that's up there before you with the totem being the tallest uh, sort of on the, um, on, the, on the top corner as you enter the car park. So these are all in site McDonald's signs. Um, so they're, they're more in the dip and the bowl of, of the bunker site. Right. There, there will be another application for the sign at the front, but that's not for you today. Right, so that has cleared things up considerably, okay. thank you. Any other questions? So, can I just ask for some advice on on the proposal? So, are we going to ask for a, propo a proposal on each item? Yes. yes. So, can I ask for a proposal on agenda item six? Councillor Horncastle. Councillor Sharp has second. So we will go for a vote. Debate. A debate. Yeah. We will go for a debate. <laughs> Councillor Sesford. Yeah, hi. Thank you very much. Um, yes, it is a motive, as Councillor Horncastle said uh, before, and um, a bit like Marmite, there'll be those who love it and those who, uh, who, who don't. However, you know, what we have in front of us here is a building, irrespective of what it's for, because that's already been passed, by the way. We have a building which is set back and uh, almost enclosed by, uh, and I'm trying desperately to find the picture, uh, almost in enclosed by the... Uh, the hotel on one side and the, the Littles on the other side, it's set back. Um, and as was said before, all these signs we're looking at today are within. And they've dropped one sign down from 12 foot, the, the totem, uh, 12 metres, sorry, down to four and a half metres. Now four and a half metres is quite big, but it's a lot better, 12 metres. Uh, 12 metres, uh, the sign is actually in a dip, so 12 metres would actually come out of the dip. Uh, the four and a half metre one is uh, within the dip. And I, I think what you have to realise is the business. And so they have to advertise. That's, uh, uh, you know, it's what you do. You let people know where you are. So I think the officers have uh, worked quite hard um, with, with um, this business to try to mitigate things as best as they could. And if you've read your notes, you'll find that some of the, the signage was actually on the back of the building, the, the, the south side which has been removed now, and I think that's a, that's a good help. Um, but, but, you know, the, there's always going to be some people who are saying it's an ISO, and other people will be clapping their hands, that's arrived here. But you have to advertise it. Now, is there, um, have, is, is this too much advertising? Um, and I'm, I, I don't think it is, to be honest. There were, before, I had a few concerns, and I've mentioned this to the officers before, and, uh, and, like Councillor Kennedy, I, I, when I first looked at this, I said, is a totem we're talking about on the road? And clearly it's not. That's coming back to us, and that'll be a totem, I suspect, for all three businesses, the Travel Lodge, the Littles, and the, uh, the McDonald's, and that is something, a bridge we'll cross when we come to it. But it's not the bridge we're on at the moment. So um, what I've seen in front of us, I think, is compromise, uh, as good as compromise we're going to get for a business that is allowed to trade, it's already been accepted, and um, is allowed to advertise as well. So I'm happy that this is as good as we're probably going to get. 
Councillor Rizzle. Yeah, I'm only probably going to speak on, on one of these chairs, so uh, I'll say it all now, really. I mean, you know, it says in the report that we can only really look at amenity and safety here. And, uh, you know, for me, I think McDonald's or their representatives have done a good job in, in liaising with you and coming to some compromises. And, you know, I think they should, we should recognise that and, and actually thank them for that. Uh, the fact that the McDonald's lettering isn't on the top of the building, it's set down on the building, etc., is testament to, to what's actually happened. Um, you know, for me, and I was probably part of it, but... The one I saw here is the travel lodge, not the McDonald's. That's, you know, when you're driving to Hexham at the moment, I keep thinking, God, what the heck's that? Councillor Kennedy. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, um, yeah I, I'm, I'm of a similar ilk to what's been previously said. I think that these signs are in the bowl um, below sight lines. Um, looking at the, you know, the very impressive vista that Hexham has. Um, so these signs being set below, um, I'm satisfied that, that there's been a number of adjustments made. I think the bringing down of the, 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 the sign which says McDonald's, so it's actually within the building as opposed to above the building is the right thing to do. Um, I'm also minded to read uh, 714 on page 25 and, and that mentions, and I'm going to ask officers this question, um, it says that a condition is, it, um, it is recommended a condition is attached to any consent that would restrict any illumination of signage outside the business hours in order to reduce and mitigate the visual impact of this element in the event that the site operates for longer periods during the night. The applicant's agent has advised that any illumination could be reduced during the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. to further mitigate. So, are, are we content that those are going to, those conditions are in this part of that? Yeah, thank you. They are listed um, on all three applications. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, and I, and I think that's a that's a really good good move to, to do that because obviously we don't as yet know their trading hours. Um, so, but but I, I do. I am more concerned about one that is a sign that will be that's going to be brought back as to how that fits in with the the general vista of Hexham, the conservation area, etc. Um, but I'm satisfied that what we have before us is reasonable. Anybody else? So we'll now go to a vote. I'll ask. Tessa to confirm what we are voting for today. Um, we're voting in line with the officer's recommendation as set out in the report and I believe there was an updated condition too. So can we have a show of hands who is for this proposal? Well, that's unanimous. So that's unanimous. Passed unanimous. We'll now go to agenda item seven. I'll need a proposer for this application. Oh. Councillor Oliver and Councillor Riddle. We'll now go to debate. I'll move to the vote. Can I have a... Can I ask Tessa what we are voting for? Um, along the same lines as the previous application, so it's in line as set out in the officer's report with the updated condition too. Can I have a show of hands for? Yep, unanimous. Unanimously there. And now we'll go to agenda item eight. Um, I'll need a proposer. For this item, Councillor Hutchinson and a seconder, Councillor Stewart. We can move to debate. We'll go to a vote. 
and Tessa will just confirm what Again, we are. Again, it's set out in the report with the updated condition too. Sorry, Tessa. Sorry. Is that only related to the second application which is 2500? I think I'll let you say it's the first one as well, but it's only okay. application 2500 which we've just spoken <coughs> about. This one is as per the report. As per the officer's report. Thank you, okay. Can I have a show of hands for... Yeah. Again, unanimous. So that's passed unanimously. Thank you very much. I will go to agenda item 10, and that is just for information. And I'll pass over to Trevor Sessford for agenda item 11. Thank you very much, Councillor Scott. Uh, right, agenda item number 11 is the date of the next meeting, uh, which will be 11th of January at 4 p.m. at the moment. I assume it'll be here, but uh, as you know, it's an ever-changing landscape, so I can't guarantee anything. Uh, but that's what outstands at the moment. Uh, question 12, urgent business. Now, we had a request for some information to go to future meetings. And again, because of the nature of what's happening on at the moment, is um, you'll, you'll hear about them when they happen. But there is one, I was specifically asked about the North East Ambulance Service. Now, the, the council member that asked it isn't actually here tonight, but, you know, it could be watching. So I'll put this information out. Um, and I did actually reference this at the, the meeting when asked this question. Uh, the North East Ambulance Service will be present at the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee uh, meeting on April the 5th, 2022, which will be screened live. If there's any questions any member wants to ask, please forward this to the chair of the committee and ask them if they can allow the question. They'll make the decision, obviously. The chair of the committee, by the way, is uh, Councillor Jones, Veronica Jones. Anybody else got any urgent business? Nobody's approached me about anything. So in that case, I'll just say a happy Christmas. Or a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to all members, to all officers, anyone who's watching on the live stream, and any resident anywhere within a Tyndale Lack area. Good night. Thank you. Finish the live stream, please, Ian.